I'd like to welcome you all to, to today's Exceed webinar on, on Python tools for data science. My name is Chris Myers. I'm in the uh, Center for Advanced Computing or CAC at Cornell University. Uh, and what I'm gonna present to you today is really kind of an introduction and overview to uh, some tutorials that we have on our Cornell Virtual Workshop or CVW site uh, in, that are in, go into much more detail on this entitled Python for Data Science. This was developed by, by myself in collaboration with Jeff Sale at the uh, San Diego Supercomputing Center. And so I'd like to give a big shout out to Jeff for, for all his hard work uh, on in developing these tutorials. Uh, the slides that I'm presenting themselves are actually a live Jupyter notebook that I'm running. And these are available in this GitHub repository that's, that's listed here. Um, the talk, uh, I should note, is being recorded. Um, I should verify that it's in fact being recorded. Yes, it is being recorded. Um, and, and will be posted uh, afterwards on, on our CAC YouTube channel, which is linked to from our the CAC education page. Uh, there will be time for questions. We certainly, uh, the, the chat is disabled, but the Q&A, the Zoom Q&A uh, box is open for you to uh, submit questions in. I'm hoping we can deal with most of the questions uh, toward the end, but if, if, if things arise along the way, there are some natural kind of section breaks where we can try to take some quick questions. And certainly if anything's unclear, um, please, uh, please you know, feel free to, um, to, 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 to let us, to ask those questions. And the way that that will work is that my colleague, Adam Brazier uh, is, is on here and he will, uh, he will be monitoring the Q&A to, uh, to ask questions at, uh, as they arise. Um, so let's get going here then. Um, so data science is really kind of a big and, and amorphous uh, kind of a field that, that brings together a lot of different areas uh, in computational science and statistics and machine learning, as well as in areas like data visualization. And so it really involves a lot of different kinds of activities, uh, all the way from sort of accessing and importing data in the first place to, to building predictive uh, models and analysis pipelines. Um, and due to both its expressive, the expressive language and the rich um, ecosystem of tools, uh, Python has really emerged as a central player in the world of data science. And that's kind of the focus of this talk today. And um, I'd like to kind of distinguish between Python, the language, and Python, the ecosystem. That at its core, Python is a is a very uh, expressive uh, programming language, an interpreted, dynamically typed, object oriented uh, uh, programming language that it is easily extensible with compiled code to allow for efficient uh, numerical performance. But it's also a big ecosystem of packages, libraries, and tools that support. Uh, work in a number of different areas. And the one we're focused on here today is, is kind of data science uh, as it connects to other areas of, of computational science. Uh, excuse me. Um, so for many numerically intensive tasks, um, these packages in, in this ecosystem are, are actually partially written in compiled codes that you see or C++ or Fortran, and that it's accessible within Python. I won't really be addressing that today, but we do have uh, another one of our CVW tutorials on Python for high performance that talks about uh, that that architecture and, and the use of those tools in, in much greater detail. So if you're interested in that, I, I'd recommend you look at that. Um, so I, I'm mostly going to be focusing on this, this Python data science ecosystem, which involves a large number of packages, uh, some of which I've listed here, and which I'll be sort of revisiting in, in, in more detail throughout the talk. Um, uh, at its core, I mean, we have things like NumPy and Matplotlib, which play kind of a central role in in, in, in kind of a layered ecosystem and a number of distributions such as uh, the Anaconda distribution or uh, provide bundles that, that bring a lot of these uh, packages together and PIP and the, the Python package index provide a lot of support for, for managing these kinds of packages and environments. This is just kind of a visual overview of what I was just stating that we have kind of Python and, 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 this, and the C Python interpreter and API that, that is, is actually running these programs, but then we have a layer uh, of uh, various packages that, that sort of progresses upwards towards more and more complex kinds of calculations. Uh, and we'll be talking about some of these packages today. Um, in, the, in the CVW tutorials, there were a few different data sets that we chose to focus on, uh, one of which involves uh, baseball statistics from the baseball data bank, another which involves a set of tweets and retweets from uh, uh, collected uh, uh, by the Twitter API. And that was really uh, that. That effort was led up by, by Jeff Sale. And then, and then finally, a set of uh, a data set describing California wildfires uh, historically dating back many years. Uh, for purposes of, of time and sort of coherence today, I'm only going to be 
kind of talking about these baseball statistics, but if you're interested in seeing seeing more of this, uh, I, I would encourage you to, to go visit the, the CDWs uh, on our site. Um, data, of course, come in many different forms. So there's not gonna be a one size fits all kind of solution to, to dealing with data, but often we end up dealing with, you know, kind of regular array data or tabular data that might arise in a, in a spreadsheet. And so I'm gonna talk um, about some of those kinds of things specifically here. Um, so, so NumPy is short for numerical Python is this, is this key uh, library that provides multi-dimensional arrays. And, and I've kind of sketched out the anatomy of a NumPy array here. These are multi-dimensional so that they get a multiple axes and they have a shape which describes how many uh, entries there are along each axis. And then uh, a given array has a, has a given D type, a given data type. So in, in this one I'm showing here, these are just integers, but you could have floats or, or complex numbers or what have you. Uh, the pandas data frame kind of extends this notion to provide some additional information. So there's both an index, so there's sort of labels for the rows as well as columns, labels for the columns. Uh, and, and as you might imagine, say in a spreadsheet like this, the different columns can have different, can have different data types. So it was where a NumPy array is homogeneous in type, uh, a pandas data frame can mix in, across different columns, different data types. And so we'll look into some examples of how this works, but it's useful to, to understand this basic kind of architecture um, in, in working with these tools. So one of the very nice things that Pandas provides is support for reading data tables. Uh, and so for example, we have this the, the baseball uh, data bank uh, uh, data sets that I was talking about. And, and this actually, um, is all uh, embedded in a single directory. There's, I think, 27 different CSV, uh, comma separated value files that can be that can be read in. And the key the key function that Panda provides here is is this read CSV. So I've imported pandas as PD. This is kind of a shorthand convention that's often used. And and if I pass it the name of a file, a CSV file, it'll read this and it'll create what is called a pandas data frame. And so this little function that I've written basically just extracts using the glob uh, live, uh, module in the Python standard library, extracts all the CSV files from this directory, reads them in one at a time, and then stores them up in a big, in a big Python dictionary. So I'm gonna run that command. It, you can see it's running with the little star here. So that function is now defined. And so now if I go, I can read in, for example, all of the uh, data sets, and I'm storing them now in this Python dictionary that I'm calling bbdfs, baseball data frames. And if I look at the keys, of this is just a Python dictionary, I can see that I've read in all of these different uh, data tables from this data set uh, that, that address various aspects of historical uh, baseball uh, statistics. Um, so one of the things that's very nice is, for example, uh, once I've read this in, I can look at one of these data frames, say this batting data frame. The head method is, a, this is a method on a data frame that produces a new data frame that only shows you some small number of, of lines, the default is five. And note that there's missing data in here, that there are some entries that are not in, in the data set, but, but hand, pandas can deal with these missing data very, very easily. And it can, in fact, can often compute summary statistics over, over data columns that have missing data in them. So that's very nice. So this is, for example, the batting data frame that shows for every player and every for every year, every player who played during that year and all of their batting statistics that are recorded in this. Uh, similarly, there's a teams uh, data frame that, that describes uh, each of the teams that played uh, uh, over the history of baseball. Um, so uh, one thing that, that, that's often very helpful is to be able to augment uh, a, a data frame with additional data that's derived from data that's contained within it. So for example, uh, in this batting data frame, there's no it does not explicitly contain information about one, about single, about one base hits, because that's kind of redundant as it's just the difference between the total number of hits minus the number of two base, three base, and four base hits or home runs. And so it's very easy just to sort of uh, add, for example, a new column, this 1B column to this data frame by, by, by indexing on the column names of the other pieces that we're, we're interested in. Um, it's often useful to get a, a good summary view of, of, what a, of what a data frame consists of and, and sort of what the numbers look like. And there's a describe method that, uh, for example, we can use on this, this, this team's uh, data frame. 
that provides summary statistics for you know, the total number of counts, the mean, standard deviation, min, max, quartiles. Um, and this is, you know, this is often a useful thing to do at the, at the outset when you're working with a data set to, to get a sense of, of sort of what it consists of. And, and I would note here, right, the result of this is actually producing a new data frame that's got a different, a different index and a different set of, of columns. Um, there's often a lot of substructure within these, uh, these kinds of data tables, and, and it's often useful to try to um, tease apart some of that substructure. And so, for example, Pandas provides what are called group by operations that provide support for kind of a general technique that's known as, as split apply combine, where you can split a data frame into groups based on, on, say, the identity of some key. We can apply an aggregating function across each of those subgroups and then combine everything back into a single data frame. Right? And we can do this uh, using Pandas methods rather than having to work out all that logic ourselves. So for example, we might uh, want to look at this, this batting data that I looked at before, and we want to say, get some uh, aggregate statistics for each year in the history of, of Major League Baseball. And we can do that easily by grouping on this year ID. So it'll, it'll collapse together every, every row that has the same year ID, and then we want to sum those up. And if we do that, now we see that for each year, we get, we get total sum totals of all the different types of, of hitting outcomes in baseball. Um, this again also produces another data frame, which I've named batting by year. And you can see that, that by default, the, the index of this new data frame is the, is the, the, the key that I, that I grouped on. So in this case, the year. In some cases, that might be what you, that might be useful for what you want, but sometimes you might want to be able to push that um, thing back into the data frame. And so, for example, you can just chain along this additional method, reset index, and now if I run that again, we see that the year ID has been pushed back as a column in the data frame, and the default uh, integer index has, has been has been uh, restored. Um, if I want to, I and of course, sum over or you know, group and sum over over other columns. So, for example, if I if I group by the player ID instead of the year ID, now I get the career, and I sum that up. I get the career hitting batting statistics or hitting statistics for each player in this big data set. Um, uh, I, in both these examples, I was just showing you this sum aggregation, but we could apply other kinds of aggregating functions to compute means or or, or other kinds of things. Or we could write our own custom functions to aggregate over those over those subgroups. So this is a very uh, kind of useful and powerful kind of technology that's that's available within these within these data frames. Um, so pandas is dealing. Uh, I mean, these data frames represent single tables, and although in this case I had 27 different tables. Um, but often we have a data set that uh, involves a set of tables that are connected through shared data. And this then leads naturally to, to the notion of, of, of a relational database. Um, and one of the nice uh, tools that is provided in the SQL ecosystem is something called SQL Alchemy, which allows us to sort of work with uh, SQL databases. Um, so in this little bit of code that I have here, I've written a little function that's going to take each of my 27 uh, data frames in my in my baseball data set, and I'm going to write them to a to a SQL uh, to a, a SQL database. In this case, I'm writing them just to a, a SQLite uh, database on disk in in on my in my local directory. But I could connect, say, to some remote uh, uh, SQL server if that's what I wanted to do instead. And the key function that SQL Alchemy is providing is this create engine. Uh, function that lets me that lets me connect to this this database. So now, if I run this, what this is actually doing is is writing each of these things off to a, to this file, and as I note, it it ends up generating you know a, a new a new database uh, bbdb.sqlite that that is about 34 megabytes in size. It contains all of that information, but stored in such a way that now we can access it from from using SQL. Um, so, for example, now that I've created this thing, I can make a, I can access information by making SQL queries. So I can, if you, I don't, I'm not going to go into sort of the, the structure of, of SQL queries, but but if you know this, you you would recognize this as a type of query we can do. And so, for example, we can ask, you know, what uh, tell me from this batting table that we've been looking at uh, the, the the instances of most number of hits h uh, per year, and we see the first ten that I've asked for here. In terms of uh, the num most number of hits in a season by different players, 
Um, it's a it's a little confusing because the only thing we know about these players are these somewhat obscure player IDs. But of course, what SQL one of the thing, nice things that SQL provides is the ability to do more complicated kinds of queries, joining information from different tables. So what I can do, for example, is I can join information from the the, the batting table that I've been looking at, along with the people table that tells me about who the who the people actually are. And if I do that that this more complicated query. Now I, I'm able to extract the, the first and last names of these players, and we can see that the, the, you know, the record for most hits in a season uh, of 262 was accomplished by Ichiro Suzuki. So, so again, by, by having data in a SQL database, you can, you, if you know that, that query language, you can, you can really use it to, to, to extract data um, very, very effectively. Um, so I'll, I'll pause here for a quick moment. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm going to segue out of Pandas and data frames per se into some into some other things. So I don't know if we have any. We do questions. have two, two two questions. Okay. Um, one one from Igor was uh, pointing out that CSV and I guess all, all text based formats are very inefficient for storing numerical data, both in storage size and cost of conversion. Does Pandas support any other binary formats? Um, it, I mean, it, it supports. Uh, yes, I mean you can re. You, I mean, it, uh, I'm trying to think of. If you were, um, I mean, you can certainly read from Excel spreadsheets, but that's not what you're looking for. I mean, I, I, I guess I would, there's, I, I would need to look and see what um, there. I, I, I'm, I suspect there is. I would just need, I would need to. I, nothing's jumping to mind as a, as sort you, of you an can read, You, you can read NumPy arrays, can't you? You can read NumPy arrays, although, um, right, I mean, and those those can be done. And so I suspect it's using that under the covers. It's just, I guess I haven't seen an example of that. But yes, I mean, you could you could read each of the NumPy arrays if they were in some 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 binary format, but you would you'd want to, um, yeah, you, you might need to coordinate what that looks like. But that is a very good question, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think NumPy save, I guess, is what I was thinking of. Okay, right. another one is, um, this is a this is a probably a larger question than we have time for. But what what method do you employ to clean a data set? Um, th there's uh, you know the cleaning as you know cleaning data is a is a huge part of the problem of data science, especially if you get data that's not very clean. I, I mean I think certainly I mean I think it's really whatever is required by the by the data you know that you're working with. I mean data can be unclean in lots of different ways, right? So certainly there are methods in pandas for for you know, identifying where they say there's missing data, or filling it in, or correcting, uh, and we talk a, a little bit about this on, in the, in the CVW in more detail. Um, but it's really sort of you know needing to um, you know often if if there are misspellings of names, and in fact you know two things should be should have the same spelling, but they end up appearing differently. You can you can sometimes identify that by by looking at the set of unique names that that appear, but it is it is there's not sort of just a, a simple, um, you know, clean this all up because of course um, that's that's kind of an open ended thing. Yeah, uh, just another couple of questions. Uh, one's a technical one about how, how will the slides be made available? Uh, so they are in. So in this, uh, I, I see that. Um, I guess you would right. You would put it in the in the chat. I don't. I'm. Um, I don't. I. I guess that the the attendance can see right. So there is this this GitHub repository. This uh, GitHub.com/cornell.cac repository where where this this Jupyter notebook that I'm running is, is in there. So that's that's sort of the easiest way to, to get at that. Um, okay. And uh, there's also. Uh... I, I believe I know the answer to this question, but it says raw SQL queries are okay, but can you use SQL Alchemy as an object relational model to read data in? I believe that's true because- That is true. I mean, SQL Alchemy, Alchemy yeah. really bills itself as an ORM. I've only ever used it to sort of do these, you know, to do these kind of SQL things. But yes, I think it's much more powerful than what I've what I've explored here or at all really, so. Um, yeah, and okay, one, one last question. Uh, what methods do you use for larger than memory data? I.e. say you have a two terabyte fixed width text file, which sounds awful, but- uh, yeah, no, it does sound. I mean, I, I guess there are other kinds of tools. I mean, that might be necessary. I mean, so there are other things uh, in the ecosystem. Um, so Dask is one possibility, which which is something that sort of builds on top of the APIs provided by NumPy and Pandas, but that is really intended to, to sort of support, um, you know, potentially things running in in parallel or or with very large. Um, I guess I don't. 
that that is a good question uh as to as to what uh you know um you might need to read it in in chunks you know i mean it's sort of again it's a question of what specifically do you need to do with that data um you know to 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 once you once you are able to read it in can you summarize it in chunks for example i, I yeah it, it's an um, maybe we should move on and we can sort yeah. of re revisit some of these things. Um, and thank you very much, Adam, for, for uh, I guess you're answering these, these things get answered yeah. along the way so we can keep track of what's still open. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, data visualization now. Um, and really the, the, the cornerstone of all this is, or a lot of this is, is Matplotlib, uh, which has been around for a number of years, which provides a sort of a low level comprehensive plotting API. Um, which is modeled in part after sort of the, the MATLAB kind of plotting interface. But one of the nice things about this ecosystem is that other more recent packages have kind of layered on top of that um, using Matplotlib for, for the under, you know, for the, the for the plotting, but then adding additional customization. So for example, pandas um, uses Matplotlib to, to sort of uh, to provide methods for plotting data from data frames and series. Seaborn, which I'll talk a little bit about, uses Matplotlib with an emphasis on sort of characterizing statistical distributions, stats models, I'll also mention is something that, you know, allows us to sort of plot statistical models along the data. And at the end of this talk, uh, I'll mention uh, Bokeh, which is not based on Matplotlib, but which allows for some nice kind of interactive web-based visualization. So this is just kind of a simple example here. I mean, I've got this batting by year. This is, I, I, I constructed this by, by this group by operation. And now I see that there's a, a plot uh, dot scatter method on this data frame that I that I can use to, for example, plot um, over you know over each year uh, the the relationship between the number of home runs hit and the number of strikeouts. But because this is producing a matplotlib plot, I can use the low level matplotlib interface which we've imported as PLT to 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 provide additional information. So so I can I can kind of augment. Uh, what's provided through this this method um, to customize it in, in ways that Matplotlib is very is very good at. Um, Seaborn, I'm going to start this one now because it takes a little while to run, but I can talk about it while it's generating. Seaborn, uh, as I said, generates some nice um, kind of characterizations of statistical distributions. Uh, it's conventionally imported as as SNS, so we'll see references down here to, to uh, calling methods and uh, functions in SNS. In this case, I'm taking this batting by year database and I'm adding some additional information. I'm actually normalizing it so that I can normalize by the number of at-bats per year since that can change over time. But, but I can also adapt, for example, additional information as to what decade uh, each of these um, uh, 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 events, each of these years occurred in, and that can be useful for this visualization. And what we're going to get in, in, a, in a few seconds is this is this pair plot, where, whereas for each of these uh, hitting statistics, uh, these hit fares, um, it's going to it's going to produce a, a sort of a grid. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to do that. Um, a grid layout for you know. So I've got I've got for each of these uh, statistics, I have them on both the, the rows and the columns. On the diagonals, I have the the distributions of these things over time. So the colors are representing this decade field that I added, proceeding from from lighter to darker blue uh, as time advances. And so I can see, for example, how you know, the number of home runs has increased over time and the number of triples has decreased over time. But I can also look at the off diagonal elements, which are the, the relationship between these different variables. So in the same way that the sort of getting the summary statistics, the descriptive statistics was useful. This is often, this kind of thing is often useful as a nice introductory overview of a data set. So you can kind of see what things you might want to drill down in, in, in more detail. Um, Stats models is, is something that provides, uh, is really not uh, so much about visualization, although I'll, I'll show an example of that, but, but is, is uh, providing support for estimation of different statistical models, conducting statistical tests and, and the like. And as such, it sort of is, is meant to provide something similar to what you would find in, in really kind of focused statistical modeling environments, such as R, or SAS, or Minitab, um, and provides a number of different types of, uh, 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 you know, statistical models that can be developed. We'll just look at a simple example here of ordinary least squares or OLS, where um, I want to uh, explore this, you know, more quantitatively, this relationship, say, between home runs and strikeouts. And so I can import this, this stats models API, and I can say I want, you know, the X, the X, the, 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 the 
independent data are the home runs and the and the, the y data are the strikeouts i want to add a, a constant so that i can compute an intercept and when i do this i then basically get these coefficients for both the intercept and the slope relating um, uh, home runs and strikeouts um, as well as various you know statistical information about about the quality of the fit and 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 sort of uh, key values and the like um, because stats models also uses this the same matplotlib api underneath we can now plot not just the data but also the result of this this linear fit that was developed and then use the matplotlib api as we did before to kind of customize what that what that plot looks like um, so that's another example of sort of layering this in this ecosystem that's where stats models is now using both the you know the data that's stored in data frames as well as the ability to make plots with, with matplotlib um, we can of course develop more complicated kinds of models uh, the history of baseball statistics is is filled with all sorts of stories of uh, i mean it's a very rich area where people develop different different uh, ways of characterizing data a lot of this goes back to uh, to this, this uh, person bill james who is considered the founder of, of modern baseball statistics and sabermetrics and one of the things that he formulated early on was this sometimes referred to as the Pythagorean theorem of baseball, which tries to relate the, the, the fraction of games that a team wins, so W over G, as a function of the, the, the number of runs that it scores and the number of the, uh, that it allows. And, and, and this was the formula that he originally wrote down. And because it had this exponent two, which is sort of vaguely reminiscent of a, the Pythagorean theorem of, of, of right triangles, this is, this, this is how it acquired this name. And so he originally formulated this, this uh, with the exponent two, but then other people have looked at it later and have estimated different kinds of exponents. And so for example, this is what using this data frame, we can plot this, this win ratio W over G as a function of this runs allowed over, over runs. And then we can use, for example, uh, SciPy, which is a very nice package that provides a lot of different numerical algorithms for estimating what this exponent ought to be based on the data. Um, so we can write a little function, which, which in this Pythag function, which, which encodes this, but now not with exponent two, but with any exponent. And we can then use the curve fit uh, function from the scipy.optimize uh, module to, to, to estimate uh, uh, an exponent from the data. And, and, and at least in this, in this fit here, it, it predicts this, this P optimal, this, this, this optimal exponent to fit the data as 1.839 as opposed to two as was originally formulated. And then of course we can, we can plot the data and this red curve, which is our optimal fit is ostensibly slightly better at fitting the data than the, the you know, the, the other curve, which was, which was originally uh, estimated or predicted by James. Um, so, so that's just a very quick example. I mean, the field of parameter estimation is huge and there are many different issues that arise, but this is sort of a typical way you can kind of use different parts of the ecosystem to do this, this kind of estimation from data. And so I guess I, I was gonna pause here and see if there are any kind of quick questions about data visualization, modeling and, and parameter estimation. Okay, so we have one uh, anonymous question, uh, how to export those figures in the notebook created by matplotlib as PNGs? um well certainly you can you uh if i mean matplotlib lets you save things as pngs um i mean i did i did that right that's actually what this thing is right here so plt.save so what whatever thing i create in the in the window here you know by layering different commands i can save to a png or any other kind of file it just it just does it whatever format based upon the suffix so that's so, so when I ran this, I actually just created a copy of this thing, but, but I don't, I guess, I don't know if the question is whether there's something within the notebook interface itself. And I guess I would need to, to revisit that. Oh, no, that's, I, typically, I, I, that's typically how I, I say those things. Yeah. No, I think, I think that satisfied our uh, right. question. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then I'll, I'll move on. Um, I want to talk a little bit about networks. I mean, there, it's a field that, that has gotten a lot of interest over the last, um, you know, 10 or 15 years and, and, and which often arises in, in complicated data sets that there are sort of natural kind of network um, relationships that we can explore. So, I mean, a network or, or called often mathematically as a graph is a type of data structure with nodes or vertices that are connected by edges or links. And these edges can be undirected, they can be directed, they can be weighted. I mean, there's lots of different ways of constructing 
networks um, based on what data you have. And Network X is a very nice Python package that lets us build and, and manipulate and analyze um, complex networks and, and, and use a lot of kind of uh, established network algorithms. So this might allow you, for example, to compute shortest paths between pairs of nodes or identify sets of connected components or characterize very various kinds of centrality measures, um, identifying kind of communities within networks or, or study the statistics of random graph ensembles that, that, that might be useful for, for characterizing some, some system. Um, so in Network X, we can, for example, um, build a, 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 a network of, of baseball players, and I'm calling this the co-player network. So this is something like the co-actor network that maybe you've, you've looked at to play what's called the Kevin Bacon game. So in the co-actor network, network uh, actors are connected uh, to each other through movies that they, that they appeared together in. Um, so we can, for example, build a path from Kevin Bacon to Marissa Tomei through through the movies JFK and My Cousin Vinny. And we can do a similar kind of thing in the baseball world. We can create a co-player network where two players are connected if they are on the same, the same team in the same year. So Babe Ruth was on the 1919 Red Sox with Wade Hoyt, who was on the 1937 Brooklyn Dodgers with, with Burt Haas. And it's actually very easy to sort of build up this kind of thing using the capabilities of both Pandas and Network X. So the key data frame that we have here is this appearances data frame from the, the baseball data set. And instead of looking at the head of the data frame, we could, for example, look at the tail, which shows us the, the, the end of that data frame. And then we can use this group by functionality that I mentioned before. To, so in this appearances, this, ha, this tells me, for example, that this person was, was you know, on this team in this year. And so I can group by year team combinations, extract the player IDs, create an empty graph, and then iterate through that group that group by data frame to add edges that connect players and their player IDs to these pairs of, of year and team IDs. And, and, and that's all I need in order to, for example, uh, if I look at this player, the second from the bottom, uh, this is Ben Zobrist who played on this set of teams uh, from 2006 to 2018 uh, in, in, this, in this data set. Similarly, I can look at, at and this is by looking at neighbors of his, his neighbors in the graph are all the teams that he played on. And I can look at neighbors of, of, of a team, for example, the 2016 Chicago Cubs that he was on, uh, who won the World Series, and I can find all the players who were on that. So I can build up this network. And then once I have that, I can ask about things like shortest paths. So the shortest path uh, function in, in Network X, which is imported here as, as NX, uh, tells me how I can connect through a series of players and teams from Babe Ruth to Ben Zobrist. Um, again, these player IDs are a bit opaque, so I can write a little extra code using this, this people data frame that, that we've looked at before. And I can find, for example, that, that Babe Ruth was connected to Ben Zobrist through this uh, series of people who are, who are listed here, who, who we who we saw in the schematic of the network before. So if you've got if you've got data that so even though there was not the, the original data set was not describing a network, it was describing just the, the baseball statistics. Um, there is a network embedded in there that we can build, and and the tools provide us a very effective way to to kind of do that thing. We can also ask, for example, who is the center of the baseball universe, who's closer to everybody else than 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 anybody, and we can in fact compute this what's known as the closeness centrality for everybody in, in the entire data set. I've only done a few here from Ben Zobrist and Babe Ruth and, and Minnie Minosa. And it turns out that Minnie Minosa has the largest closeness centrality. He is the center of the baseball universe. And in fact, he's also on this, this shortest path from Babe Ruth to Ben Zobrist. And for those of you who are baseball fans, maybe, this, maybe you recognize why this is so. It's because that even though he had a long career of his own, he came out of retirement two different times in the 1970s and 1980s to play one game each, uh, each time. And that then made him this, this, this very embedded person in this co-player network. So this is just a, uh, a, an example of what we can do with the baseball statistics. This, even though I'm not talking about this Twitter data, this is a big network that Jeff Sale put together on retweets. So this is a network that connects uh, you, uh, Twitter users who are retweeting other Twitter users, and you can build up a very elaborate network and, and develop very rich kind of network visualizations of the sort shown here. Um, 
by, by using these basic kinds of, of Python tools. Um, so I'll pause there and ask if there's any questions about, about networks in general or about the network X package that, yeah. that I kind of mentioned there. You do, you do have some questions. Okay. Um, Mark asks, are those edges added by list order appearance? Um, I, I, I uh, well, they, 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 you don't, um, I think they are, but they don't, they don't need to be right. I mean, they, 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 if you ask, if you ask, you know, what are the, I mean, none of the algorithms, uh, that, that traverse a network by themselves, uh, re, you know, rely on that, on that order. So I think they might be because it essentially uses things like, like dictionaries underneath, which more recently have, have, have used, um, have, have supported that, but, but, but algorithmically and conceptually, they don't, they don't need to be, um, if that answers that question. And I see there's a question here, can network X analyze large numbers and millions of interactions? Um, I think it really, you know, you can, you can try, I mean, it certainly has been used for that. I think, I mean, it depends a lot on, on, on how big, you know, on, on what additional data, because one of the nice things about this, about network X is that it makes it very easy to add attributes to both nodes and edges. So you can have additional information that gets attached to those things. Um, certainly it has been used for, for large things like that. Although I should note also that, that um, in some cases where network X is kind of insufficient for very large graphs, some people use iGraph, which is a well-established, um, it's a C++ graph library, but which has a Python uh, interface. Um, and so certainly there, there are some people who, who um, I mean, I don't think iGraph has quite as much developed in the way of kind of algorithms that have been implemented, but, but certainly for dealing with very large graphs, that is something that, that, that people choose to do if network X is, is, in, is insufficient. I should note also that, that there are some useful ways of, I mean, that some, if, if something will fit in memory, but that, but you want to say calculate a, 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 a quantity about every node in the network, sometimes those things can be calculated independently of each other. And in fact, on the network X web pages, there are some, some examples showing how to use the Python multiprocessing toolkit to, to parallelize that, that um, those independent graph traversal kinds of questions. Also, Chris, I, I, I gave a partial answer, but I think what you were just saying there in terms of using a C++ library with a Python interface, there was a question um, from Joy about what, why might one prefer Python over R for this sort of thing, and w without wanting to get into a, a sort of a, a war, um, I, I, I said I thought in practice, you know, pe people probably start off being familiar with one and just continue on that track. Uh, what Wayne pointed out, it's good to know both, but I, I think another reason why my, one might, is it fair to say that that there's a particular library you're interested in that's very performant and it has an R interface or a Python interface, but not both. Right, All the, and a third point is, is that, and I guess I, I know, I mean, both Python and R do allow, um, I have capabilities for linking with, you know, with, with compiled libraries underneath, but I my general sense is that the, in Python, that is a much better developed Tech, you know, set of technologies. I mean, there are lots of different tools that 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 do that. Um, and in you know, emphasizing different aspects of that of that interfacing, um, and they often do it automatically. I mean, there are parsers that can parse, you know, header files and build build Python interfaces. Um, and 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 increasingly, the use of a lot of kind of kind of just in time compiler technology is being used to 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 sort of optimize some of those kinds of things. So. Um, Right. I mean, if but you're right. Certainly, if there is an existing interface, that might be the reason to use it. But, but um, certainly, I mean, uh, you know, there are lots of tools that I'm not talking about here that do enable you to to build inner Python interfaces for things that that don't currently have them. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And there's one last question here. Um, could Network X visualize the flow map, for example, the number of people moving from one state to another? Um, I I don't. I mean, if you're just asking about a, a static visualization. I mean, it's uh, it it could sure. I mean, if the flow map. I mean, if you would you presumably would compute that. I mean, uh, from from data. I mean, you could construct you could construct a network and then how you know wherever that data was that was you know describing that movement, you could attach those things as 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 attributes. For example, to the edges connecting connecting you know the 50 states or and 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 then you can you could 
provide you know information in the plane to, to situate them on a map. I mean, so certainly there are, I mean, if you're talking about a, a dynamic visualization, so Network X, I should say, is not really focused. Its main, its main emphasis is not, um, is not network visualization. There are other packages that sort of do uh, a, 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 a richer job of that. It's really about allowing you to sort of build um, and analyze, you know, uh, data that live on networks. But, but uh, certainly the, the sort that is being the, the question that's being asked that um, that could be done. And, and there are examples in the um, in the in the Network X gallery that uh, that do that that sort of show different different uses. And I should note also that NetworkX uses matplotlib underneath for its graphics in the same way that some of these other, other things do too. So it's not, again, reinventing the wheel. Um, but, but if you're really interested in very elaborate, so for example, the, the, this visualization here that Jeff Sale did, this was actually something I think he produced using Gephi, which is a, not, a Python, not a Python package. It's a separate standalone um, network visualization utility that he, but we were able to, you know, he was able to import, I mean, Network X, uh, there are kind of some standardized graph formats, that data formats that people use. And, and so you can, you could do an analysis within Network X, write it out into one of these formatted, these graph file formats, and then read it in some other place if you wanted to do something different. Great. Okay. So, um, I think Chris, you're going to start the this last session. Or any other questions will be dealt with at the end. Is that correct? Right, right. Yeah, this will be the last section here, and then we can, and then at the end we can, right, we can revisit any of the topics. Um, so this last section is just is about machine learning, which is obviously a very important um, part of, of of data science. Um, and and which um, and again, which Python sort of plays a a big role in. Um, there's sort of a sometimes a distinction between maybe made between kind of classical machine learning. Techniques and and more and and sort of deep learning techniques in particular, um, uh, classical techniques might involve sort of you know ridge or lasso regression using decision trees or random forests or support vector machines, other kinds of techniques, and scikit learn or sk learn as it's as it as the package is actually called uh, is a very nice environment for for using a lot of these um, kinds of, of using these kinds of methods. Um, in deep learning, um, you know, we were specifically interested in using neural networks um, and in training neural networks to, to, to represent data. And, and there are a number of, of Python related packages, TensorFlow, Keras, and PyTorch and CAFE. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about those here, although I am in the process of developing a new CVW topic, uh, the Cornell Virtual Workshop topic on deep learning. And so you can keep an eye out for for that once that's finished. But I will note um, just that that Python is again, very well suited. Uh, one of the reasons that it's used um, is not because of sort of the nice, you know, high end. I mean, partly it's because of the kind of the object orientation of the language that lets you represent networks um, very efficiently, but also because numerically we can build, you know, the developers have been able to build very uh, performant uh, compiled code, uh, compiled libraries underneath um, that support not just uh, things like NumPy array, you know, really multi-dimensional arrays that naturally arise in these neural networks, but also that support this, this process of automatic differentiation so that the, this is needed in order to, to train uh, neural networks to data using backpropagation. And, and so all of these kinds of libraries use this, this ability for Python to talk to compile code underneath to support very rich um, environments for doing this automatic differentiation. Um, but scikit-learn supports a number of different techniques and both supervised and unsupervised learning and lots of the sort of the infrastructure that one needs in order to do model selection and cross-validation and, and the like. Um, and that's kind of summarized. This is a, uh, their cheat sheet that I, I grabbed from their site that kind of leads you through some of the, the major kinds of things you might want to do, whether it's classification or regression or clustering or dimensionality reduction. And, and, and this is kind of a way to lead you through based on what type of data you're working with and how big it is in, in terms of what methods might be useful. Um, so I'll just show a couple examples here. One is uh, k-means clustering, which is a well-used, uh, often used um, method for, for grouping data, data elements into clusters. Uh, in this case, we're, we're, um, we're, we're using the, this method from, from scikit-learn, so from sklearn.cluster import k-means. And then with this batting data, this baseball batting data that I've been looking at, 
In this case, I'm looking at a, at a feature vector with uh, 15 different components in it, and I want to cluster those together. In this case, I want to say cluster it into 10 clusters and, and see what those clusters look like. So I can run that, um, and and then I can, and then for example, once I once I've run that, I can look at what these these uh, these cluster centroids look like. So what K means clustering does is it identifies centroids in this feature space such that everything, every data element within a cluster is, is closer to, to a given centroid than to any others. And, and what's plotted below here, just using kind of a simple matplotlib uh, uh, subplot uh, method is, is the 10 different centroids in this 15 dimensional feature space that k-means clustering has identified. So, so uh, again, by combining uh, different tools from from the ecosystem, you can you can sort of start to tease apart uh, features in your data. In this case, doing uh, clustering, which is a type of unsupervised learning, but certainly there's lots of support for supervised learning techniques as well. Um, another unsupervised learning technique is dimensionality reduction, uh, and TSNE is a is a popular method for in this case, compressing some higher dimensional feature space into, into some smaller number of dimensions, say for visualization. And this is an example of what's known as, as manifold learning. So scikit-learn so in this manifold sub, sub module uh, provides a TSNE function, which basically performs this embedding. It takes this, this big data set uh, of, of batting statistics in 15 dimensions and figures out how to, in some sense, optimally embed them in this case, into two dimensions so that we can visualize it. And then I've just kind of bundled that embedded data into a, into a data frame. Uh, I, I'll note here, I'm not going to run this here since this sort of takes a few minutes to run um, you know, when, you're, when you're running it live. And I don't want to bore you with sitting there watching that. But once we've taken, we put this embedded data into a data frame, it's very easy then to use the kinds of things that Pandas provides to add additional information. So I can add, so every, so what this embedding is, is every player in the history of baseball is living somewhere within this 2D plane that I'll show you. And now I can add additional information such as whether that player is in the hall of fame or not, whether they were a pitcher or a, or a position player um, and what their name is. And then one of the nice things that we can do is use this, this uh, web-based inter interactive visualization library that I mentioned, Bokeh, um, which uh, allows us to sort of develop interactive uh, uh, ways to, to interrogate the data. So Bokeh is a, is a Python library, but it interfaces to JavaScript underneath. So it's a Python library that generates JavaScript, which then a web browser can, can, do, can, can allow you to visualize. Um, and it can either run in kind of a standalone mode where you just create a, an HTML page, although it's an HTML page you can interact with, or it can be run in a kind of a server mode where you write additional, you actually have a, a, a Bokeh server running and you can write Python callbacks that then change the visualizations based on what kinds of user interactions you have. Um, so in this case, we'll just look at this former case of, of this kind of uh, working with HTML. Um, so this, does, this looks a little bit different than matplotlib. It, it, it's got its own, it basically sort of focuses around plotting glyphs. Um, the key kind of data type, new data type that Bokeh introduces is what's known as a column data source, which you can think of as kind of like a Python dictionary or a, or a pandas data frame. And all I'm doing here is I'm bundling a lot of this information from this, this data frame that I constructed in the TSNE embedding into this column data source. And then I can create a figure and I, and I can, in this case, make a scatter plot. I'm going to make a scatter plot of all the data, but I can, for example, plot different people with different colors and different radii based upon different, different information. And in this case, this just, just produces an HTML page. Um, and I've got, I've got an example of one that I pre-computed. This is from our, our CVW tutorial. So this is, I call a map of hitting in baseball, but this is now an interactive data set where again, every player, every point is a player in the history of baseball and, and players have been put next to each other if their batting statistics are kind of similar. So for example, down in this corner, we see Babe Ruth and a number of other sluggers who um, hit lots of home runs. Uh, down in this corner, we see uh, players uh, who, who sort of hit, you know, had other kinds of hitting profiles. 
The blue dots are the are pitchers. So pitchers don't hit very well. So they're kind of in one part of this map. Pitchers all kind of hit similar to each other and not very well. The position players have a different set of hitting profiles. And then the, the big dots are the people who are in the Hall of Fame. So we can sort of see that there are clusters of people with, with um, you know, different statistics. We can zoom in on pieces of this. Um, sorry, we want to zoom. You know, this is an interactive thing. So we can zoom in on portions of this if we want to explore people in more detail um, and look at relationships of things. So this is a, um, and we're supporting doing this with this kind of hover, you know, this this kind of hovering technique. Um, so this is a this is a nice way of creating interactive visualizations um, from data, and again, it's kind of bundled lots of different pieces of the ecosystem together in order to kind of support this kind of thing. So um, I guess with that, um, I'm I'm done. Let me sorry, my screen got a little. Um, um, so, so I hope I've given you at least a, a quick sense of how this ecosystem provides many useful tools uh, and packages for data science. And it really is kind of a layered system that, that um, builds up from some core pieces such as NumPy and Matplotlib to, to provide more and more complicated kinds of functionality. Um, and then of course, the Python language, you know, being as expressive as it is, is also very important for allowing you to create kind of custom pipelines. So I mentioned at the beginning that this is uh, this is really kind of intended as an overview of these CVW tutorials. So I, um, it's broken into two parts. The first part of which is on data processing and visualization. Second part on data modeling and machine learning. And again, these slides, um, as we've mentioned before, are are available as this live notebook um, uh, at, at this URL. And I'd be happy to take some more some more questions. Okay, so uh, th there's one question that um, I think related to the flow maps. Yes, it does. Uh, does I, can, can you list some packages in Python which can support plotting dynamic flow maps? Uh, I, and I guess I'm again, I'm not sure what I mean. Is, so, a, is a dynamic flow map something that is that is it like an animation or something? I mean, that can be. I mean, you can do animations within Matplotlib. So, in principle, you could. I mean, you you would you would use the um, I mean, Network X um, uses Matplotlib, and Matplotlib can be used to generate animations. Although it is a little clunky, but essentially you sort of update update frames. So that would be one mechanism of, of doing that. I don't know if if there are other packages that are specifically, um, you know, providing kind of other, you know, more streamlined support for that kind of thing, but. Um, um, I mean, one of the nice things about if you're talking about a flow map with, with um, that's that's sort of fixed in space. I mean, one of the challenges of network visualization is that if you just say, again, you've got some very high dimensional thing that you're trying to represent in in two or three dimensions, and you often just kind of get these messy balls of of stuff. Um, but if you can, if you have information about how to sort of embed those, so for example, on a map, you actually would have positions. On a plane, you can you can specify those, um, and 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 again, you you know you could you could use kind of animation techniques in these plotting packages. But I guess um, I, I don't know of something specifically for that. Okay, and there was a question that came up uh, when you were talking about k-means clustering. That's, I'm glad it's a question for you, and not for me. How to choose the number of clusters the number of clusters optimally? Um, that that is a that's a great question, and it's a sort of an open-ended question. And the, I mean, again, uh, uh, what k means does is you say I want k equal ten, um, and 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 that's what it gives you. And and ten may not be the right number. I mean, so there are kind of ad hoc approaches. Well, ad hoc in the sense that you could try different clusterings, different numbers k, and try to get a sense as to whether um, you know it, you're sort of Overly breaking things down. I mean, obviously, if you if you specified k being as large as as the number of data points you have, every point would be in its own cluster um, and would be perfectly coherent with itself. But that doesn't really that doesn't help much, and it doesn't help much in the in the other limit of putting everything in one cluster. There are kind of information theoretic techniques that people have developed that try to. I mean, it sort of becomes kind of a model selection process, right? That but but information theoretic techniques that that try to find an optimal K based upon other, other measures. But I guess I don't, um, um, you know, I, I don't have a specific reference to point you to uh, for that. 
Okay. Uh, on the dimensionality reduction, uh, there's a question. Is there support for UMAP, which is Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection? Um, that's a good question. Um, we, uh, we can, I mean, if it's not, if it's, you know, it, there's a lot of stuff that's in scikit-learn. I would have to look to see, I mean, I guess we could look to see if, you know, we can go to scikit-learn.org. Um, I mean, one of the great things about the scikit-learn website is that there's all sorts of wonderful documentation, not just about the software itself, but about these kinds of methods, right? That that it, I mean, it, it talks a lot about um, the, you know, it's a, it's really a great textbook, if you will. Um, so I'm not seeing a UMAP here, but it's conceivable um, that there are, other, you know, that there are other packages. Again, this is one package uh, that is available that brings a lot of stuff together, but there may, you know, there, I don't know if there's a, a something else that provides UMAP. One of the things that is interesting is that scikit-learn, um, you know, even in, in deep learning packages such as TensorFlow and, and PyTorch, they actually are partly, I mean, scikit-learn is often kind of used in conjunction with those. I mean, so they can, they they know various things about, about interfaces that are provided. And, um, but I, I guess I, yeah, I, we'd have to, I'm not seeing something specifically there, but, yeah. but, uh, but who knows. Yeah. So what, what, what Wayne uh, and I simultaneously found um, a, a, a link that I put in the chat and that Wayne has put in the Q&A that uh, is at umap.scikit-tda.org. So okay. that, that, I mean, that, that, that's as good as my Googling Wayne may know better. Sure. Than me, and but, and uh, I should mention yeah. the scikit, right. So the scikits, I, I didn't mention it, but that's a good point. I mean, so there are, there are lots of different scikits. I mean, scikit learn is probably the most well-known of them. Um, scikit image is also a very widely used thing for doing image processing. And some of the scikits are very tailored to a specific kind of computation. But, but, um, but there is sort of this overarching infrastructure of scikits. You, um, uh, I guess it's, I think it's scikits.org. Yeah. Um, and so, so it, just by the name of that, perhaps that is something um, that's part of that collection there. Okay. Um, so the question, this is uh, an interesting question actually about sort of uh, teaching using this. Have you found that some packages are easier or harder to teach to students, specifically teaching data science to non-STEM students who get lost? And do you have any experience teaching data science to say political science majors? Um, I, I do not have um, experience specifically with that, although I have developed data science um, um, teaching materials that are, that are meant to be sort of broad, you know, very broadly applicable and don't necessarily assume a lot in the way of programming. I mean, I think one of the nice things about, I mean, I think people do often have experience with things like spreadsheets um, in various contexts, even if they don't do a lot of, of programming themselves. And so in that sense, you know, if, if they've collected data in a spreadsheet, then, then I guess one of the things I like to try to give a sense of is how, you know, they're not just um, reliant on what kinds of things say uh, an environment like Excel might provide or, or you know being able to write macros but but by bringing that data into something like pandas they can they can they can you know they can develop their own kinds of analyses that might be um, um, so I mean in that sense I guess I mean panda I mean I, I think it um, pandas because it does sort of produce you know it does deal with 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 data structures that might be familiar to people from other kinds of contexts that 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 might be easier um and and if i mean i should know i should note that pandas data frames are very similar to the data frames that one finds in r and so sometimes people have 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 some experience with that but but um but in terms of what packages in particular i mean i think scikit learn is is as you can sort of see from the documentation is really is very much um uh about trying to, to, to empower people to, to develop analyses of, of different sorts. And in that sense, might, that might be easier than some of the, the deep learning toolkits that are being developed, which kind of maybe throw people more in on the deep end. And I, I would just add to that, if I may, Chris, that um, I haven't taught political science majors, but in uh, one of the collaborations uh, I'm in, we, 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 we teach people who really don't have any computational expertise and they're trying to do, you know, gravitational wave detection. And we found in general with Python that the notebook approach that you've taken here is really good for um, sort of hiding the, the, the complexities of being a programmer and just making it so you can explore the data. 
Right. And Jupiter, Jupiter notebooks are great for, for certain kinds of things like um, developing, you know, kind of an, you know, analysis pipelines. I mean, they're not great for developing, you know, large, um, large libraries and environments, but certainly for, for end products of, you know, of sort of uh, presenting results and documenting things, uh, uh, presenting analysis pipelines and results, they're, they're, they're wonderful for that, so. And we're just over the hour, but there is one uh, there, there is one question that may be dear to your heart as a baseball enthusiast. <laughs> um, have you have you tried coloring nodes for hitters known to have used performance enhancing? Uh, I, I, uh, I have I have not done that, although I should. Yeah. And I and I as far as I know, there's nothing in the in the baseball data bank that 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 that, that, that includes that information. I mean, I could certainly assemble it myself. Um, I will note, for example, that in the uh, the history of baseball. And so in, in the CVW here, this is now what our, this is uh, part one, uh, Python for Data Science part one. And we saw this before, we saw this, this, this plot. Um, we also, you can plot, you know, heat maps for correlations between different things. I do have this history of uh, average number of home runs per at bat over time where I, where I note various, you know, important watershed moments, the end of the dead ball era, you know, when major league baseball players were off fighting in World War II. And right, so there is an era here that I've demarcated where steroids were rampant and then steroids begin getting tested for where home, you know, you can sort of see where home runs are increasing dramatically. But this is just, this is not at the level of individual players. This is, this is, um, you know, this is aggregate. Um, and so then once testing for steroids started, you know, this, this thing started coming down again. And now we're in this in this era of fascination with launch angles and the like, so um, so it's 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 fun to be able to uh, to take what you what you know about about the game of baseball and and relate it to these statistics. Um, well, thank thank you everybody um, for 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 joining in and for all your great questions.